I wasn't expecting that to work so easily. <laughs> Go for yourself. <clears throat> So uh, a certain audience member has already accused me of putting buzzwords in my project title and my presentation <laughs> title in order to catch your attention. Um, the word containerize, you could call this uh, many different things, but um, you know, he's probably right. But what I'm going to talk about is the, uh, this idea that creating a container format at the FSF or maybe anywhere into which we can put anything considered an initiative and then deploying that format will enable us to increase our financial resources, improve our effectiveness, communicate better about our work, and make decisions more quickly with uh, less stress. I'm going to talk about the background and motivations behind this effort, uh, where it's coming from, why I think we need it, um, about the progress that we've made on it so far, uh, and uh, including one brief, very brief uh, case study. We don't have a whole lot of time here. Uh, but this is all very much a work in progress. You know, I, I take presentations at conferences as a good opportunity to do some deeper thinking about some area of our work, and then go ahead and present you know, whatever state those things are in. Uh, it's part of my, uh, how I find time to, to both do presentations and to think about larger issues at the organization and also how I try to push us more into working more transparently and more in the open than we have in the past. So that's an important thing to do for any organization and especially an organization in the free software movement. So I specifically said non-software initiatives in the title because I expected most of this meeting to be about um, metrics and practices and software projects. Uh, and I wanted to make some space to discuss the possibilities of applying those kinds of lessons and tools to other kinds of initiatives as well. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't want to treat people in an organization like their programs or computers, because they're not. <laughs> and that's a big you know, management failure that is all too common to treat people and processes like if you just fix the process and add one more instruction, that'll stop the problem from ever happening again. Uh, and we all know it doesn't actually work like that. Uh, but I think we can learn a lot of things from uh, how code, how programs are constructed, and how uh, successful collaborative software writing happens, and apply a lot of those lessons back to other things in organizations. So I see the role of a container partly to provide a uniform shape to things that aren't by nature uniform or aren't uniform to start with. Um, but a container also helps make the shape. So uh, kind of like uh, squeezing, squeezing into a pair of skinny jeans, right? The, the jeans. Uh, define the shape as well. So by applying the container, we kind of force things to uh, become more uniform. And I see the initiative containers as having kind of an interface and, and attributes similar to what you have in an API with a library or a program. And hopefully that will enable us to do things like uh, make comparisons between things that are otherwise hard to compare, get rid of uh, snowflake processes within an organization. Uh, make sure that the design of an initiative from the beginning allows us to measure and track the results, improve our understanding of our own capacity, you know, get an idea to be able to count things that we're doing more easily by bundling them together, have a common vocabulary to assign and track tasks and who is responsible for those things, um, and clarify the purpose of each task, each thing that people are expected to do within an organization as part of their job. Because in my experience, that really helps uh, help keep people happy, it helps um, make sure with the, the clearer you can see the connection between the task that you're asked to do and the ultimate aims of the organization, the clearer you can follow that chain all the way up, uh, the more willing people generally are to, to really give the work their best and the better they feel after doing that. You know, I know that's, that's true for me and I find that to be true for other people as well. And uh, it'll help us provide almost camera ready materials for public consumption. So doing grant applications, publishing annual reports, you know, informing our supporters each year about the work that we've gotten done. Uh, making these containers and using this particular format will help us do that. We can just revise them a bit and it'll be uh, the format that a grant application needs to be in. Even if we didn't think this was a good idea, we're kind of being pushed toward it by external forces. So uh, Charity Navigator, an organization which, rate, which rates charities according to, in the past, criteria of financial uh, health and accountability and transparency is now adding a third category called results reporting. Uh, they started this process all the way back in 2013, but they haven't deployed it yet. Um, and basically this will evaluate charities partly based on how good of a job they do at reporting, at tracking and reporting the results of their work. So metrics essentially, adding a third column for that. Um, these ratings are important. You know, some uh, grant giving foundations explicitly say that you have to have a four star rating to even qualify, potentially qualify. Uh, plus a lot of individual donors look at these types of ratings when they're making their individual giving decisions. So it's, we want to be able to, uh, we have a four-star rating now, we want to keep that, 
Um, and also, I'm very interested in, in other charities working in free software, uh, being able to have a solid rating too, since that helps us achieve our mission and get to the place we all want to get to. Unfortunately, I think the criteria are pretty reasonable overall, so it's not like we're doing a bunch of extra work just to satisfy somebody's rating. You know, uh, meeting the rating also does produce positive changes within the organization. So the first thing that we need to start with uh, in order to establish this format is a clear vision of what our, our perfect world is, you know, what we're trying to get to. So the FSF is pretty simple. The FSF and the Nintendo Project, we want all computer users to be able to do everything they need to do on any computer, no matter what size that computer is. Uh, using only free software. And this differentiates us from a lot of organizations working in this area, because in our perfect world, there is no proprietary software. All software that anybody uses can be inspected, modified, shared. Uh, but obviously, this is a huge mission that will require many years to accomplish. Um, and it's huge not just because of the number of people that it affects, but also because of uh, the number of angles and approaches and opportunities that there are you know, just think about all the ways that proprietary software is embedded in societies around the world. Uh, you know, regulations, laws, subsidies, social inertia, network effects, schools. You know, every one of those things is an area to be addressed. And if we're not careful, and, and frankly, we haven't been careful enough in the past, we end up uh, trying to tackle all of them at once and try to respond to uh, everything that comes up. And that leads to us being very response-driven and not proactive. Uh, good, uh, a lot of lessons for us to learn from uh, Sumana, showing ways to say no and, and drop things that aren't absolutely necessary. I'm hoping that this format is a way that we can help get there. So I really started thinking about this uh, last year when I wrote a presentation for OSCON for the FSS 30th anniversary. My plan was to give a presentation about uh, how far the free software movement has come in the last 30 years or how far we haven't come. Um, but in trying to put that together, I realized that I can't do that because we don't have any metrics to evaluate the actual success of our efforts. Um, I apologize profusely for this and ask not to be fired <laughs> and uh, promise to remedy the situation over the next year. Um, I ask not to be fired because I see this as a key part of my job. I am supposed to monitor the success of the organization and uh, figure out how we can improve it, be part of the voices that figure out how to improve it. Um, but by way of an excuse, my education is in liberal arts. Um, my master's is in writing and poetics and poetry. So prior to my uh, career at the FSF, the only metrics I was really familiar with were of the iambic pentameter variety. <laughs> but I'm learning, um, and I really do appreciate, there's a lot of experts in this room, I would appreciate you know, reading lists, uh, pointers very much. Um, as a staff, we do an annual goal setting process where uh, for each fiscal year, we pick individual goals, team goals, and goals for the organization. So for my individual goal for this year, I picked, uh, for one of them, I picked uh, doing an inventory of all of our current initiatives so that we can start this process of uh, figuring out how successful each one of them are. Um, but don't get me wrong, it's not to say we don't measure anything at all. Uh, we do, and we have been getting better at it. We're constantly improving at it. That's one of the areas where we've made the greatest strides over my um, 13 years at the FSF. I'm not going to read through all these. They're pretty typical uh, things that people doing advocacy work measure. Um, but I want to point out that uh, none of these really tell you if we're accomplishing anything. So almost all of these are ways to measure the audience. But I think Donald Trump has shown us that measuring the audience doesn't necessarily translate into measuring support. Right? People might follow you as an audience member because they uh, are working against you and they want to keep tabs on you. They might just find you entertaining or interesting. Uh, they might just realize that you are something lots of people are talking about and they need to keep up with it. Um, so just because you have a lot of web traffic doesn't mean that you're convincing new people that they should start using free software or that all software should be uh, freely inspectable, modifiable, and shareable. You know, you can look at other things like fundraising goals and the number of associate members. Those things tell us a little bit more, maybe, but even those can be misleading because uh, an increasing number of donors to the FSF, an increasing amount of donations, could be a sign that our existing core support base thinks we're losing, and they're doubling down their commitment in order to try to help us not lose. Right? That doesn't mean that the number of people that are actually supporting uh, the organization is expanding. So we don't. That's why at OSCON I had to admit that we don't really have a solid metrics for evaluating our success toward that big mission statement. Uh, tools that we use to measure things, 
uh, pretty basic and common, I think. Uh, FSEF uses all free software for all of our operations. We find that there's a lot of tension between measuring uh, things and the values in the free software community, like privacy. So, you know, some of that just leads to simple choices, like we use PWIC instead of Google Analytics. But it also means that we get much less granular information because we aren't willing to track down to very specific individual identities, and our supporters were not like that if we did do that. It means we don't track open rates in emails. Um, we do track click-throughs in emails, but that's by a, a transparent, visible PWIC link that uh, isn't obfuscated. It shows you what the actual URL is, and it just has the PWIC tag on the end of it. So we're constantly like, figuring out how to navigate that tension. I think that's something um, relatively unique to the area of working in free software and, and values like that. So the first step in uh, remedying our lack of metrics uh, started after my OSCON presentation with the FSF's uh, first ever <laughs> strategic planning meeting with our board of directors uh, and myself. And we met basically to agree on some goals <coughs> to figure out what we were going to try to start measure, measuring. And those goals were idealized as five-year goals. Uh, but this being the first time we've done it, they're pretty vague. Uh, they need to be refined a lot. But I wanted to go ahead and share uh, a sample of what we came up with. So five years, ready, available, modern hardware that supports free software. As in, you can just go online and buy it easily or walk into a store and buy it easily. Ending regulatory mandates of proprietary software, things like what's happening now in the US with the FCC uh, regulations possibly leading to a complete lockdown of any device that has a wireless radio inside of it. Uh, public schools adopting free software for student use. General public seeing free software as their issue, you know, basically making free software an issue like, you know, gun control or immigration or refugee status, you know, not on the level of importance necessarily of all of those things. That's, you know, uh, don't want to equivocate things, but just that commonality of discussion, that um, distribution throughout social conversation. Uh, a greater proportion of new developers choosing copyleft and GPL v3. Increasing the amount of GPL enforcement happening. That's, uh, you know, that's, this is a good goal to have on the short list and a bad goal to have on the long list because in the long term, everything is free software, so we don't need any GPL enforcement. <laughs> and finally, uh, transforming our own organizational culture, and this is a verbatim quote, to improve productivity, retention, and joy. It's a goal that I think every organization probably has. So now that we have some goals, uh, I wanted to start on the inventory process. And my first step at that was an article in the FSF Bulletin published last fall that uh, lists 30 basically random things, just things that we do at the FSF. You know, everything from campaigning against DRM to uh, hosting a civic CRM meetup at the office. So it was a brainstorming list just to give people an idea of the kinds of activities that we do at the FSF on a, on a regular basis. So that list of 30 things is available um, in our bulletin online. And the list you know, doesn't cover everything that we do, and it doesn't cover all the things we need to be doing, but it's a good place to start with to consider whether we're already, even that short list is already too many things for our staff, which is 12, you know, to do along with our board of directors, which is nine, and our community of core contributors, which you know, uh, has a wide degree of, of numbers in different areas. And then the next step was to take it to our, one of our regular campaigns and outreach team reflection meetings, we call them, which are a space that we set aside roughly once a month to try to step back and talk about bigger issues, um, get away from the specific weekly you know, things that we're tackling and try to talk about topics like this. Uh, so this is a photograph of the whiteboard after that meeting. This is what's the project planning you know, meeting without a whiteboard. It's actually the first requirement in the format that I'm describing is, does the project have a whiteboard? It must say yes. Mm -hmm. The format that we came up with uh, has three basic parts right now, the draft version of it. Description, costs, and outcomes. So description, uh, we have for any initiative a text description, which is for external consumption or public viewing, and that has a long version and a short version. Um, the short version is what you might see, for example, if you go to the website, uh, fsep.org slash campaigns, and we have like a few sentences describing each one of the major campaigns that we're working on. That's the short version of the initiative description. The longer version would be something that you might use in a, a grant application or in an annual report setting where you're giving a little bit more detail about um, what the initiative seeks to do or, uh, uh, or internal processes and in the uh, internal wiki or manual that the staff use. 
We have task lists, which is just the bundle of things that have to be done under the umbrella of the initiative. The infrastructure that it depends on. Uh, the FSF, we run all of our, host all of our own servers. We own all of the machines. So that's an important concern for us, is how much the infrastructure requirements are of anything. Dependencies on other initiatives. One of the main reasons to do this is to be able to draw connections to see which initiatives have a lot of other initiatives depending on them. Uh, and that can help make decisions about priorities, resources, and which things can be cut. Communication channels. You know, uh, does the initiative use the, our internal IRC channel? Does it use our bulk mailing lists? Does that have live events, in-person events, things like that? Outside stakeholders, basically who the audience is who we're trying to influence. But of course, for applying the internal processes, the, there might not be any outside stakeholders. Bottom liners, which is just the people who are responsible for each part of the initiative, and the materials inventory. Um, we find that for everything that we do has some connection with physical materials, materials online. And a uh, big problem we have is keeping track of those things. As people, you know, new staff get hired, previous staff might move on. Um, keeping track of what materials have been around and connected with initiatives is something that we think an inventory like this should accomplish. Costs are very straightforward, staff time, non-staff time, and a budget other than staff time. You know, most of our budget goes to pay people to do things. Uh, but we do have uh, money that we spend on producing materials, videos, uh, travel budgets for conferences, that kind of thing. And we have outcomes, organizational goals that the initiative works towards. Uh, that's uh, drawn from the five-year goals, basically. You know, is it helping to end regulatory mandates for proprietary software? Is it helping to make free software a kitchen table issue? Then the goal-specific metrics for those goals. So we have a following here, a list of general metrics that we think apply to just about every initiative. But for specific goals, we want to come up with the kind of metrics that I referenced not having at the beginning to measure our success toward achieving those things. Uh, revenue, audience, number of donors. We like to pay attention to our number of members at any given time, uh, but also the number of non-member donors. You might just give us a, a few dollars during the fundraiser. External feedback. One of the projects we have going right now is a survey on fsf.org slash survey. Uh, part of the, any initiative can be the results you get back from that or a campaign. We get a lot of people emailing us, telling us those things, telling us things, their opinions about it. We want to catalog that feedback and have a system for incorporating evaluation of that into our evaluation of any initiative. Press coverage and engagement. So clicks, shares, signatures. I'm just going to breeze through a very quick kind of case study example here. Our Defected by Design campaign, which we've been running for about 10 years campaigning against digital restrictions management, management, or DRM. You can see a list of tasks that go along with this campaign, monitoring the news, writing blog entries about it, sending out action alert emails, uh, designing materials. The infrastructure the campaign depends on, so VCRM, Drupal MediaWiki, dependencies on other initiatives within the organization. We have interns working on it, so it depends on our internship program. We have uh, an, an event which is large enough to be its own initiative, the International Day Against DRM. Uh, and the campaign has a strong connection to that. Communication channels, we do mass emails, geographically targeted emails, conference presentations, microblogging on a variety of platforms, uh, live in-person protests, videos, and materials inventory, hazmat suits. I don't know if anybody has been following the campaign long enough to remember when we used to put on the bright yellow suits and protest outside Apple stores and Microsoft stores, but that's a physical material associated with the initiative, as well as all the online materials like FAQs and uh, information online about the area. And stickers, you know, can't have a campaign without stickers. <laughs> Costs, staff time, that's the list of positions that are that do something related to this campaign initiative, and we would break that down by hours per week and so on. Non-staff time, we use contractors very occasionally to do design work uh, and board member time. And some of our board members have been involved in this campaign. And financial budget, other than the staff time, the kinds of materials that we buy, conference travel, or presentations, that sort of thing. We see this campaign as working towards making free software a public issue because DRM is a lot of people's first real negative experience with what proprietary software does, how it takes control of your computer away from you. Uh, and then also, maybe the most surprising one, use of GPLv3. One of the major accomplishments of GPLv3 was a way to stop uh, GPL software from being used in an environment where it was just restricted anyway by DRM so that people can't actually modify 
the software that's on their own device. So the Defective Cloud Design Campaign is partly aimed at eliminating DRM so that uh, Chief LV3 uh, raising the DRM issue so that people see the reason uh, and the value in that feature of GPLv3. And engagement things, we might measure petition signatures, uh, protest attendance. We do actually have um, live protests still with this campaign. And this is just a list of other initiatives. You know, part of the, the difficulty about this is what qualifies as an initiative, really. You know, so what's an initiative, what's a task? So these are some examples of things that I consider initiatives that I hope to apply this to. The Libra Panic Conference that we run every year this year, uh, included in the middle of March, is actually the thing that spurred the creation of this format because it's such a big project involving so many of our staff and so many of our resources that I really feel I need to get a better handle on it. But also things like the fundraising mailing on paper that we still do twice per year. You know, what are the benefits from that? What are the costs involved with doing it? Uh, and then staff professional development is another kind of different initiative that I think still fits into the system. What do we do to provide our staff with opportunities to advance their skills, and what are the benefits of doing so? Kind of a harkens back to the, the PayPal opening presentation. Of, does it help people feel you know, good about the, how, we, how are you helping people feel good about the work that they're doing? <coughs> of course, I hope you'll support our work on this. Um, I wanted to highlight the survey that I mentioned because, like I said, I'm looking for input and advice about metrics. Obviously, telling me in person or emailing me is a great way to do that, but we also have a formalized way running until the end of January. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the future direction of the FSF. That'll be taken down on January 31st. Um, and come to Labor Plan. Uh, we're going to have some presentations uh, relevant to a lot of the interests that are being discussed here today. That's March 19th, 20th at MIT. So thank you very much. I hope to provide updates on the format and examples of us using it so other people who are interested can uh, copy it and help improve it.